Right now, AI is something that investors should really be excited about. I know people right. are hearing a, a ton about it, and there's probably people who are like, oh, we're already at the peak, like, you know. But this is, you know, this has been compared to personal computers and the internet as far as how big it's going to be, and I really don't think that that captures how big it's going to be. Right. You know, um, it's going to be bigger, and it's going to continue growing. Yeah, I mean, you look <clears> back, you talk about the dot-com bubble, you know what I mean? And there was, the market definitely got ahead of, ahead of itself. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, like there was just, you know, billion dollar valuations for companies that, you know, had just an put, idea. Up, put up a website and an yeah. idea. They didn't uh -huh. even really have a product. This time, um, you know, you, you can make comparisons to that. However, a lot of the players involved are already generating a lot of revenue. Well, yeah. Um, it's not just the users. We're talking about revenue customers that are yep. that are coming into play rapidly. So it's very different. And and I think even back then, eventually, all that hype around the internet actually did come true. Yeah. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Angel Research Podcast. My name is Jason Freert, and I'm here with Jason Williams. What's up, buddy? Uh, not much, Again, the temperature's up. <laughs> yeah, we got to. It's, it's comfortable in here. It is. Um, and uh, we have a a pretty major, I guess, news event that we that we have to talk about, and that's the attempted assassination of former President. Trump. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I know you weren't talking about Volkswagen rescuing <laughs> Rivian. <laughs> no, the, although we can talk about that if you want. <laughs> um, but it seems like that, you know, it's obviously a historical event that doesn't take place very often. And it seems to have sort of altered the trajectory of the election, although it seemed to be kind of swinging towards Trump's way anyhow with mm -hmm. the talk of... Um, Biden getting replaced, right, right, um, and or just you know all being that talk removed. seems to have gone away. I, I I wonder if that means that everybody's afraid to face him now. <laughs> There's nobody that thinks that they could beat someone that just survived a shooting. Yeah, I think, and it seems you know I haven't kept up too much on it. I just go off of what anecdotally I here mm -hmm. around but mm -hmm. it seems that like yeah everybody is kind of just like okay like he was already trending in that direction and the talk was all about biden getting replaced and now you have this mm -hmm. with the picture and right. and well, all when that you look at historical precedent you know reagan would have been the last you know president that there was an attempt on and uh you know, his popularity surged after yeah. that. His, actually, his approval ratings were pretty low when he got shot. And then by the time he got out of the hospital, he was everybody's favorite person. Yeah. I think so, the doctor said, uh, you know, he, he asked the doctor. <laughs> you got to love Reagan for, like, cracking a joke while he's pr practically on his deathbed. But he asked the doctor if uh, – he said, he, I really hope you, you're a Republican. <laughs> and apparently the doctor responded, uh, Mr. President, today everybody's a Republican. Nice. Yeah. Didn't he said something to his wife when he was in the hospital? Like, I forgot to duck or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like now as long as, you know, it, it's just like we were just talking about the NFL. It's just like run out the clock time, like, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, so who who knows? But it yeah, also there's four months. There's a lot. To there is. There's months. a lot of stuff. I'm sure um, the Democrats had something planned for some you know for a late and also the the, the market's doing well yeah the so. market's doing great i saw i saw a uh, a headline since you know we're talking about the assassination a little bit like that's basically said that the s p 500 is the safest trade in history and that this assassination attempt proves it you know it's been up right yeah um uh, of course who knows what it would happen if it was an actual like if it's a successful, a successful I, mm. I think you know things could have got gotten a little hairy um so but i mean that sort of leads us to talk about um where the fed might be going because even just two to three weeks ago i think people were predicting no rate cuts mm -hmm. you know maybe until november or right. even just none the rest of this year yep. just going into the election and now with a actual 
uh, low, like a, a negative CPI report, right? So the first time since, you know, basically COVID, mm-hmm. the prices month over month actually went down on, on a, according to the CPI, which, right. you know, we all know there's flaws with that. But um, the headlines were actually true now mm-hmm. that inflation went down, or I should say prices went down. They yeah. were always saying inflation was going down, right. which means it was going up less right. than right. it was before, but it was <laughs> still above that 2%. So prices Tricky. actually went down, yeah. um, which, you know, seems to be giving an indicator that a lot of people think the the Fed is actually going to cut rates. Maybe well, and in you September. look at uh, like how they've been talking, right? Uh, up until this point, you know, when Jerome Powell, the the chair of the Fed, speaks, he's been talking about you know data, and his focus has been entirely on inflation. Is inflation at a level that we feel comfortable like discussing cuts yet? And uh, what a couple of weeks ago, when he spoke in front of Congress at the Humphrey Hawkins uh, testimonies, um, he was talking about the second mandate of the Fed, and the Fed's dual mandate is is to moderate inflation and to keep employment at a, a strong level. And he started talking about employment, and he started talking about unemployment numbers coming up. And, you know, if his focus has shifted from inflation to unemployment, those are at two opposite ends of the spectrum, and they have one tool, which is monetary policy. And so you can either fight inflation or you can fight unemployment. And you can't do both. And if he's focused on unemployment, then that tells me that rate cuts are coming. Yeah. And, you know, you uh, you, you saw an article yes, the other day, uh, I think it was yesterday, where they said there's 100 percent. They're betting on a 100 percent chance of a rate cut in September. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. 100 <clears throat> percent anything is, uh, is kind of scary. Unless it's actually currently happening. Like if it's like yeah. raining right now, say there's a 100 <laughs> percent right. chance of rain. Right. Or a hundred percent chance that the, the sun's going to come up the next day. Right. Although even that, you know, a hundred percent chance never of know. a period of light followed by a period of darkness. Yeah. Um, it's, but yeah, uh, it's crazy. There's a, uh, I think they're giving 60% odds for uh, one in July at the end of this month. Uh, so the fed meets at the end of this month, their meeting will end on the 31st. And they're saying that there's a 60% shot. They could cut rates there. A hundred percent shot that they'll cut rates in uh, what, September? September, yeah, because they're off. I guess they don't really do anything in August. There's kind yeah. of like a blackout period. Yeah. So um, that'll be interesting because I think before, even earlier in the year, the whole idea was, hey, they're going to cut rates in September to sort of boost at least the market or the economy in the short term leading into the election to, quote, to in theory, help Mm-hmm. Biden get right? get reelected pretty much. I think since um, since before Reagan, if the stock market is up the last three months heading into the election, the incumbent has always won. Interesting. Now, obviously, you have all these other factors that we're dealing with now, which mm-hmm. is you know Biden basically being senile and Biden's Trump surviving an uh-huh. assassination attempt. Yep. Um, and all these things. So who knows at this point? Um, but either way, it does is looking positive through the rest of the year in terms of in it terms is. of the market. It so is. and actually, I've got I've got an article coming out uh, the day after we record this. I don't, I don't know what day this will you know be released on. So it will have already <laughs> been out. So it's Wednesday. Yeah, we usually release this on a Monday. Um, so but basically, what I'm talking about in the article is this uh, Goldman Sachs metric. It's like a, a like a market tracking metric, and you could even call it a market timing metric. You know, I, I don't like trying to time the market, but you know, this one. It's really impressive. It's called the Goldman Sachs Bull Bear Indicator, and like everybody should check out the article about it. Like I go into detail about you know what the indicator is and how they break it down. But basically, Goldman Sachs has seen over its long history that there are six things. Six things. <laughs> Three times six two. Six things. There you go. Um, that uh, that you know when they all happen, that a bear market tends to follow, and um, it's high stock valuations. Um, it is. Uh, Uh, personal consumer overspending. So basically, like, people having to spend more money than, like, they can afford to spend. Um, It's rising inflation. It's strong manufacturing. And uh, what's my sixth one here? Um, I forget what the sixth one is. Look at the article. (laughs) (laughs) That's your teaser. Read the article to Um, get the sixth one. We'll put it in the description. But but basically, you know, like, um, inflation's not as high as it was. But it's still higher than we want it to be. 
and uh, consumer spending is definitely or is, debt I should say is it's it's getting bad but it's not at extreme levels yet but what's really driving this is stock valuations are in the highest five percent that they've been in their history um, and uh, let me see the oh the yield curve that's it and a flat yield curve was number six um, the yield curve it's only been inverted it's only been this inverted how do I say this proper? It's only been more than this inverted 16% of its history. So for, you know, the vast majority of its history, the yield curve has not looked like it does. And, you know, when it does, it, it says bad things are coming. Literally the only bright point in this metric is that manufacturing is currently weak, but weak manufacturing usually precedes a recession. Right. Right. And so I've got charts in the article that show all of these things. And basically, when this bull bear indicator reaches a level of 70 percent, a bear market has followed 100 percent of the time since 1957. How soon, though? Because <laughs> oh, there's the always going to be a bear market eventually. So that's the thing. And I point that out in the article is a lot of times it's it's pretty quick. Right. You know, um, but there have been several times throughout history where there have been what they call an anomalous bull market. And so basically, like, Everything is in line for the market to fall, for us to go into a bear market, but a bull market will persist for a year, maybe mm -hmm. two, maybe even three years. And uh, the best example is uh, back in the late 90s uh, with the dot-com bubble, right? And like it was up above 70 and this bull bear indicator hung above 70 for like three years while the market kept going up before the bubble actually popped. And it did it again, um, let me see, it did it in the early 90s and it did it uh, uh, in uh, right before the financial crisis too. And so these time periods were all different, so you can't really just look at the time period and be, oh, it'll definitely be three years, it'll definitely be a year yeah. and a half. But what you can do is you can look at those time periods and see what's similar. And what was similar there was that there was something that was driving investor enthusiasm. Um, in the dot-com you know, boom, it was the, uh, it was the internet. Um, there was something that was driving, um, that that was driving uh, money supply and it's low interest rates, you know, and every single time there's been, you know, something driving the monetary supply, basically, you know, loose monetary policy and something that investors can get excited about. And right now, AI is something that investors should really be excited about. I know people right. are hearing a, a ton about it and there's probably people who are like, oh, we're already at the peak, like, you know, but this is, you know, this has been compared to personal computers and the internet as far as how big it's gonna be. And I really don't think that that, captures how big it's going to be right you know um, it's going to be bigger and it's going to continue growing yeah i mean you look back you talk about the dot-com bubble you know what i mean and there was the market definitely got ahead of, ahead of itself like mm -hmm. uh, like there was just you know billion dollar valuations for companies that you know had just an put idea up, put up a website and an yeah. idea they didn't uh -huh. even really have a product this time um you know, you, you can make comparisons to that. However, a lot of the players involved are already generating a lot of revenue. Well, yeah. Um, it's not just the users. We're talking about revenue customers that are yep. that are coming into play rapidly. So it's very different. And and I think even back then, eventually, all that hype around the internet actually did come true. Yeah, it did right? pan out. It wasn't the pets.com and the ones that kind of, you know, uh -huh. actually were hyped up. Yep. Um, but you, you still have Amazon, you know, Apple's, you know, made its way through mm -hmm. and a host of, you know, Broadcom. you know, host of, yeah, host of, and even like after that Google was born. And then, so I think even the most wildly optimistic hype in terms of valuations and where the internet could go, it already has basically exceeded that. Yeah. So I, oh, I can see that with AI. And one of the big differences too is I don't think we're gonna have to wait 10 to 15 years for to go through this cycle like there well, might yeah. be a little bit but then it's going to come back really I mean, because, strong well you think about it with the internet you know as things were things things improved really quickly yes. like the internet grew really quickly and improved really quickly but it it improved at a human's pace you know because it was everything was being done by by humans yeah. by human programmers and with ai you know as ai gets better ai will improve itself yeah you know, so the internet wasn't improving itself. People were improving it. Yeah, and one of the big holdups I know with just the growth of the internet was the infrastructure in terms of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the things that we 
take for granted now are under common, they could only happen once people had broadband internet. Yep. You know, my first internet, I was doing the the dial up. Like, yeah, <laughs> calling into like when, you when, know, I don't and know. You're, if you're trying to like to do download this. like a website, and the pictures are like do, do, one line at a time. Do, do, if they had pictures, if they at had all, pictures, yeah, you, know, you could also do like text a, only browsers yeah. where it would just say image on there. Like, oh. I'm like oh, I don't care about that. Or, Maybe it's a cool image. I don't know. Or people would just make images with characters. <laughs> yep, you know? yep. Uh, yeah, definitely. I remember all of that, and that so, was definitely it. And you know, people were like, "Oh, you know, the internet is capable of doing all of these things." And everybody's like, "Well, then why isn't it doing yeah. it?" Well, it's because you know the technology doesn't exist for that yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think the AI thing is going to be huge and I, and it's definitely driving investor enthusiasm and financial conditions are loosening. You know, the fed, we just talked about it. There's a, a, a now a hundred percent chance. And I, you know, like, I, like you said, and, and I agreed with, I, I wouldn't give anything a hundred percent chance, but you know, I, from everything that, that I'm seeing out there, from all the data that keeps coming in, from the way that the Fed heads are talking, uh, from the way that the investment bankers are talking, you know, from the way that the Wall Street Journal is talking, you know, these guys have people's, you know, th- these guys hear things that, that everybody, you know, doesn't really hear. Like people call, you know, like the Fed, the Federal Reserve will call their friends at Goldman Sachs and the friends at Goldman Sachs will call their friends at the Wall Street Journal. And you're looking at all of these things that, that you're hearing and, and the Fed's not focused on inflation anymore. They're, they're satisfied or, or they're not satisfied, but like they know that they need to, to do something about this other side and they're a little bit scared. They don't want to get blamed for causing a recession, right. you know, holding rates too high until they actually do break something. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like a game of chicken kind of thing. And, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would hate to be in their position. You know, yeah. I say that all the time. I criticize their decisions all the time, but I would hate to have to make those yeah. decisions myself. Well, let's uh, let's talk specifics then. You mentioned AI. Are there mm-hmm. any other sectors that you're, you know, sort of deploying out into um, that are going to sort of maybe be agnostic to potential rate cuts or helpful in, in um, potential rate cuts? Well, there are definitely some that, you know, rate cuts, uh, even just the thought, like the idea that rate cuts are coming is already starting to help them. Um, real estate's one for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but leaning into the rate cuts, you know, if these rate cuts are coming too soon, which I think they maybe could be, um, because, you know, inflation follows the money supply and lower rates bring more money into the market. So more money comes into the market, inflation's going to follow that chart up. You know, so I think that, you know, we're sort of getting into a period where the Fed's going to be battling, it's going to be battling both sides of its dual mandate, and it's going to be trying to, you know, protect uh, uh, the unemployment number and keep it from going too high. And then, you know, in doing that, it's going to send interest rates back up, or is going to send inflation back up, and then it's going to have to raise interest rates. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at uh, <laughs> gold is near, uh, either hit an all-time high again, mm-hmm. or is nearing, I know it's almost $2,500 dollars an ounce. Gold always does well in periods where the Fed's fighting the economy. You know, uh, gold always does well. Energy always does well. Infrastructure always does well. Um, and like by infrastructure, I mean, you know, pipelines. And I know pipelines are a sensitive subject for people, but, you know, pipelines, railroads are infrastructure too. Um, you know, everybody loves Warren Buffett. He owns the railroads. So that should be a good, easy one. Um, but uh, natural gas, right? We, we ship a lot of natural gas over the seas, but, you know, around the country, it's easy to move it around because, you know, you can just move gas. Uh, but in order to get it into a boat and then across the ocean, you have to turn that gas into a liquid. And that requires tons of pressure, as everybody remembers from, you know, their high school physics class. I don't remember so, anything from a high school <laughs> physics class. I don't think I even had a high school physics <laughs> class, to be honest. Uh, maybe physical science or something. But anyway, you have to apply. You apply enough pressure and this gas turns into a liquid. And there are only a few places in, in the country where... Um, where they can do that. And these, that's infrastructure, you know, that's sort of like the middle, like the midstream, you know, the, the companies get the, the miners get it out of the ground or the drillers get it out of the ground. They send it to these folks, these folks press it down real tight, ship it across the ocean, shipping companies, you know, um, logistics companies, that's all infrastructure. But these are things that do well in periods like this. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is that, that, that we're going into a period that's going to mirror the 1970s, but a lot of the decisions that are being made look a lot yeah. like the decisions that were made in the 70s. Yeah, and I think that's uh, I think that's one of the hesitations of of lowering rates because they did sort of cut start cutting rates too early in the mm-hmm. 70s, and then mm-hmm. inflation came back. Yep, and they're definitely um, paying attention to that, so. but they don't want to tank the the economy. They don't want to cause a recession. 
Um, you know, and I think that they're just going to, and this is the Fed that, you know, let inflation get to 9% and said mm-hmm. it was transitory, you know, before they actually did something. So you know, they're not, they're not really great at making the right decision, you know, when they need to. So, I mean, all of those things just, they, they concern me a little bit. And, and like I said, you know, the Fed has a dual mandate that fight inflation, fight unemployment. You can't do both at the same time, you know? So like the best they can do is cut rates and maybe keep selling assets from their balance sheet. But I was listening to Bloomberg Radio on the way uh, into the studio today because, you know, that's, uh, that's what kind of interesting guy I am. Love rocking out to Bloomberg all the way, all the way to the office. But anyway, uh, they had a bond trader on and basically the guy, like he's been around for a long time. And he was like, look, like a lot of the guys in the market, like they haven't been there for very long, you know, 10, 20 years at, at most. And so they're making comparisons to what they know, which is over the past couple of decades, but we need to go back further because, you know, when I say revert to mean, I don't mean zero. Right. You know, and he's talking about interest rates there because he's a bond trader. But, you know, he's like the mean is like four and a half, five percent. Like, you know, revert to the mean. We need to look back to to, to you know, before. Yeah, which are basically period. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, I'd be it's, it's definitely going to be a big anticipated decision. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, we'll. We'll find out exactly in the next couple of weeks. Um, we will. I honestly, I really wouldn't be surprised if they shocked the market in July. I really would not be surprised, you know, because he's also said, like, I'm not going to tell you when the cut's coming. Yeah. Like, I'm going to tell you that we're thinking about it, but I'm not going to tell you when we're going to do it until we do it. Right. And they should have some indicate, you, you know, one month over month of prices reduction, but they should have some indicator of whether that might be a trend that mm-hmm. they see. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they anticipate, a, like, more reduction in prices, they might feel a little bit more comfortable um, providing a little bit of a cut there to uh, yep. to, to yep. try to head off um, a rise in unemployment. But and we got to remember too, the Fed doesn't like they're not really looking at the CPI, right? We look at uh, CPI because yeah. we're consumers. Yeah, I think they're more look index. at PPI, right? And well, and, they look at PPI, yeah. and we look at PPI because that's the producer price index. And like basically, if producers pay more this month, like consumers can expect to pay more next month. Right. Um, but the Fed does that core PCE where they gotcha. strip out a bunch of different things, and that's what they really like to look at. And I'm pretty sure that the last core PCE reading had what we would call a two handle on it, where it's not two percent, but it's it's lower than three percent. Right. You know, so it's in that range where they where they want it. seeing that two on there makes them very happy. It makes them feel a lot more comfortable about right. you know making moves that that they weren't comfortable with making a couple of weeks ago. Right. So before um, before we wrap this up, we've talked about this before, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, because I just saw the report um, is getting ready to launch. Um, tell me about Nat Gold. Okay. So <laughs> Nat Gold, man, we, were, we talked about how gold's going to do really well, um, you know, in, a, in the, the environment that I see coming. Um, but so Nat Gold is, is it's sort of a new way of looking at gold and valuing gold. And I've talked, I think I talked on the podcast about my peak gold theory, where basically, you know, we're getting better and better at finding gold, but we're finding less and less gold that we can economically extract from the ground you know, and turn into bars and stuff. But if you think about the way like gold works, like basically what we're doing is like we're digging gold up out of the ground, we're melting it down into a bar, and then we're digging another hole and putting in it and paying people to to stand around watching. I think Warren Buffett said something like that. And he was like, if aliens could see us, They'd be so confused. They'd think we were crazy. <laughs> well, because the aliens, they want gold to put into their atmosphere. To, no, I'm just kidding. Or whatever, right? You know, <laughs> to use the power of the spaceships. You know, everybody knows that. Um, I, I saw that movie, Cowboys and Aliens. Yeah, man. That's another, that's uh, I think, Daniel Craig I movie. think that's a 10th straight <laughs> podcast where we worked in Aliens. They uh, gotta, always got to mention Aliens in the podcast. Yeah, I mean, they're there. They're ever present. They're watching the podcast. I think so. Drop a comment, aliens. I like them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so Nat Gold basically like the there is an intrinsic value of gold, right? You know, people pay a certain amount of money for an ounce of gold on the market, and you can see that. And right now, it's right around twenty five hundred dollars. I think it's a little bit below. If it breaks above twenty five hundred, that's you know huge. That's the highest it's ever been. It's really sitting like up at all time highs now. Um, but there's also 
uh, you you got to take into the co- uh, into account you know the cost of getting that gold. So like when a company that mines gold sells an ounce of gold, they don't get twenty five hundred dollars. Like they get twenty five hundred dollars, but then part of that has to go to cover how much it costs, and it costs about fourteen hundred dollars to bring an ounce of gold out of the ground. Um, mining companies all have to report it. It's called their all in sustainable cost, and it's the AISC. And so every company reports it, and then they take an average and they put out the average every quarter. Um, And so the most recent one is right around $1,400. So you've got basically gold has an intrinsic value before you dig it out of the ground of $2,500, what you can sell it for, minus $1,400, what it costs to get it. So you've got $1,100 there of value that's just intrinsic to the gold before you even get it out of the ground. So if the gold like if, if what most gold is used for, which what most gold is used for is a, is a, a store of value, you know, if you're digging it out of the ground so that you can put it into another vault, why not just leave it into the vault? You know, you can figure out how much gold is in the ground. You can take that intrinsic value, 2500 minus the cost of extraction, 1400 and you get $1,100. So, okay, I've got, you know, one ounce of gold in the ground. I've got $1,100 worth of gold in the ground. I don't have to dig it up. It's there. It's safe. Everybody knows it's there because in the mining industry, in order to you know, develop your asset, you got to get money. You know, you got to borrow money from a bank. You got to bring in investors and sell equity. And the way that you do that is by proving to them that you have gold that they're going to make money off of if they invest in you. And the way that you do that is you do all these testing and you know you explore the site and you drill a little bit and you take samples and then you file this form that is called a forty-three. I want to say forty-three one hundred one. Uh, NI 43101 stands for National Instrument. It's a, a form uh, that um, they use in Canada, but it's pretty much accepted worldwide. Um, <clears throat> and basically, this is the form that you fill out that says, like, this is how much gold that we have shown is on our property. You know, we think, you know, it's worth this much money. We want to borrow, you know, X amount of dollars so that we can continue our development. Right. So this is an internationally accepted form that tells you that 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 certifies the gold in the ground and says this gold's definitely there. You know, there could be more of it, but there's definitely that much. And that's what's called when they say proven reserves. Is- proven reserves, um, inferred reserves. Gotcha. I think there's like three different levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, you know, you do more and more digging and more and more to drilling get to, to get di- higher and levels. higher and higher. Right. But so basically before you've even like started mining gold from a gold mine, you've already destroyed the environment around the mine by testing. Uh, But with that gold, what you can do is is you can do these these preliminary tests. You can do like the least invasive testing. You can certify how much gold you have in the ground. And then because we have, you know, we have the ability to create digital assets now through, you know, the blockchain and, and basically all stocks are digital assets too anyway. I mean, like maybe once or twice a year when I was at Morgan Stanley, I actually held paper stock certificates. Right. And they're really cool because they've got settled stamps just like all, oh, you can barely read like what's on the stock certificate because they've got settled stamps going back for like a hundred years. Um, but nobody uses them, you know, everybody trades electronically. Yeah, digital. And what those stocks are in your brokerage account is a digital representation of that physical share. So what Nat Gold is, is a digital representation of that physical gold that's still in the ground based on the intrinsic value of the gold, how much it can sell for once it's out of the ground, minus how much it costs to get it out of the ground. So why pull it out of the ground? You know, we don't have to destroy nature. And, and that's the thing is a lot of the gold, like a lot of the reason that, that the gold that we're finding is not able to be extracted, either it's not economical, it's, it's spread out over too big of an area. So, you know, to get one ounce, I'd have to mine, you know, a ton of dirt. Well, a lot of it, <clears throat> I guess, is political too. Some of it's political. Yeah. You know, there's, um, so one of the companies that we're focused on here, they just purchased an, or agreed to purchase a, a gold asset that is entirely surrounded by a Native American reservation. You know, and the natives do not want anybody digging up their land, no matter how much they get paid for it. So they love this idea. They're like, this is great. You know, like you're a gold mining company that doesn't mine gold. Like, that's so cool. (laughs) Well, it's but it's a political thing. You know, um, if uh, it also sounds a little bit nutty. It it is a little crazy. It's 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 not so much crazy. It's new. Right. Yes. Bitcoin sounded nutty. Yes, of course. Right. Um, Ethereum sounded nutty. Uh, artificial intelligence sounded nutty, yeah. but you know it's it's there. 
you know, and it's it's real and and it and this happen. is, I mean, this is brand new. This so is you basically brand new. have These the company that you're here. talking about is going to be basically the first, the world's that first is going gold to uh, try this idea out. Yep. So, and the really cool thing about this, right, is that these are, you know, basically cryptocurrency tokens you right. know, that they're creating out of this. So that means that, you know, Coinbase, Crypto.com, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, WonderFi, like whatever, um, whatever crypto exchange you use, you'll be able to buy and sell these things on those, you know. Um, so it's not just, you know, you have to be in one environment, you can only work with this company. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, there's lots of, of stranded gold. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I say like, you know, the, the gold that it's just too spread out or it's on a Native American, or it's on an Indian reservation or, or you know, like a, a, in Canada, like the First Peoples Reservations or it's on a nature preserve in South America or it's above the tree line on a mountain in Africa, you know, and you just, you can't get to it, but you've already explored it. You know how much gold's there. You've spent like a couple of million dollars, probably like 20 or $30 million, sometimes a hundred million dollars some of these big companies cases and now it's just a sunk cost that you can't recover so the mining companies love this idea they're like we can actually you know monetize some of these things that we've spent our money on you know we've proven that the gold's there but they're not going to let us pull it out of the ground you know but we can actually monetize this governments like it because you know governments can still collect their mining tax they can still get a little bit of money they also get to look good because they can say hey like we're not going to let them dig up the country guys you know we're going to we're going to keep it we're going to keep it safe we're going to keep it nice um you know the 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 uh, environmental movement loves it because I mean even before I had heard of Nat Gold um, <clears throat> I was seeing people at protests talking about like you know keep your hands off our land keep your shovels out of our like out of our preserves and you know they're protesting um, uh, Freeport McMoran uh, biggest one of the biggest copper mining companies in the world shut down one of its most profitable copper mines in Panama because people were protesting they were like, we don't, we don't want you here. Like, we don't want yeah. you, we, we don't want you doing this. You're tearing up our, our stuff. And, you know, the, the, it was such a serious issue that, that the company just decided, you know what, it's worth it to just not get those like millions and millions of dollars worth of copper that we were getting from there. Yeah. It's a very interesting and novel concept and, uh, it is brand new. So this is, I mean, we're talking about like ground ground floor zero, definitely. type I mean, of situation which is really what we specialize in yeah, here i mean that's you what we try I mean? and find here and you know? uh, not <clears throat> something that is maybe 20 to 30 years off you know ground floor but something that in the very near future could be you know a completely mm -hmm. brand new type of uh asset vehicle that um that you can be, I mean, yeah. we saw, and, and look, I'm not comparing this to Bitcoin or anything like that, but we saw, you know, everybody knows what, yeah. you know, how much two pizzas were sold for in, exactly. in Bitcoin and was, back was... in 2008 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these are, these are ideas that we aren't going to shy away from and no. we're going to explore and, pre and present them out and poke holes in them and, 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 uh, and vet them out so that um, people at least have the, have the, um, the appropriate level of yeah. knowledge going no, into definitely. it. Definitely. And, you know, as far as Bitcoin goes, I mean, you know, there are some similarities. There are some differences, obviously. But, you know, what you said, like, it sounds a little crazy. I was at Morgan Stanley when Bitcoin first started, you know, like people first started hearing about it and stuff. And everybody there thought it was the dumbest thing they'd ever heard of. Like, this is so stupid. Like, people are just going to lose money on this. Yeah. This isn't a currency. You know, this isn't yeah. an investment. What's it backed by? Yeah. Didn't matter. Yeah didn't matter you know within six years you anybody who was there who hadn't listened to them and had bought like two or three bitcoin for 50 bucks was going to be able to retire yeah you incredible know? all right well anybody who's interested in learning more about that we'll put the link uh in the description below we'll also put the link to your article that you so uh, yeah everybody should check that, that out it's a really cool really indicator well. and you know i mean Honestly, when something hits 100% of the time, you really got to pay attention to it. I, don't let it scare you too much. I think that the, 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 the you know, winds of the market are, are blowing it uh, further forward and not going to take it back just yet. But it's definitely something to consider, you know. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, like, comment, subscribe, particularly comment. Um, 
tell us what you think about our tree here if we should if we should move it if it's too close to us should it be closer to us uh, should it be further away should it be yeah i don't know really want to know what you think about the tree all right see ya